So good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to our presentation with Lois Harada. My name is Michael and I'm the gallery manager at the Art Club. Um, let me just pin myself so that I can, um, okay, there we go. Um, so welcome to our program with Lois Harada. Um, many of you already know Lois, I'm sure, but I'll just do a very short introduction for those of you who don't know Lois yet. Um, if you want more information about Lois, please go to her website, Lois Harada, L-O-I-S, H-A-R-A-D-A dot com. Um, Lois is a RISD alumna of the uh, printmaking department at RISD, originally from Salt Lake City, um, and has been in Providence for some time. Um, her day job is at DWRI Letterpress, um, and she's been involved in just about every way you can be, from being involved at New Urban Arts to being a city commissioner for art in city life for the city of Providence, um, she has had solo shows at Katie Tompkins projects at AS220 at World's Fair Gallery and at Sarah Doyle Gallery at Brown. Um, Lois has been in our national open show at the Art Club, uh, I think three times, and which is a big honor, very competitive exhibition that we have at the Art Club. And she's also taught at the Art Club and we are all big fans of hers. And I was saying to Lois earlier that I didn't plan it this way, but if you look over my shoulder, this is a Lois Arata on my very own living room wall. So um, I did not place it there for this evening's program. Um, so Lois is going to talk about her work tonight. She is going to give us a little tour of the studio. Um, if you have questions, you can feel free to put them in the chat function and I will read them just so the whole group can hear them. You will be muted for the whole program um, just so there's no background noise. Um, but please feel free to use the chat because I'm sure Lois would love your questions and would love to engage with you about letterpress printmaking. Um, so with that, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to unmute one of you, Lois. Should I, un let's see, should I unmute both of your accounts or just the one for now and then I'll un unmute the other one after? I think just the one works okay. for now and then we can kind of go from there. So right. let right. me um, unpin myself and I will pin Lois. And Michael, I think when you pinned yourself, you just did it on your account. My grid stayed the same. Oh, weird. Let's but see. also, Maybe I still haven't quite lighting. figured out. I think that does it. There we go. Good. Perfect. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you all. And as Michael said, we'll talk a little bit about some of my older work, take a walk around the shop, and then I'll hop back into another slideshow and talk about what I have kind of coming up and then answer questions. So feel free to ask questions about anything um, in the slideshow or on the walk around and I'm happy to answer them. So I'm gonna share my screen. Do, do, do. Nope, sorry, we've been Zooming for three years and I was just telling Michael, I still sometimes can't quite figure it out. Okay, so I'm hoping everyone can see my screen that says, thank you Providence Art Club, which I'm so excited to be with you all via Zoom and hopefully I can see you all in person soon. So as Michael mentioned, I've been in Rhode Island since I graduated from RISD in 2010. And for most of that time, I've been working at DWRI Letterpress, which is where I'm calling in from today. So we're a commercial letterpress print shop based on the west side of Providence. And the great thing about the space is that I can use the presses here to make my own work. I think uh, I studied printmaking at RISD and really love the technique and the process. But as many of you know, it's a pretty labor intensive and machine intensive practice. So being able to work in a space that has a lot of commercial printing techniques available was a really big selling point for wanting to work at this shop. So at the shop, we do a lot of um, wedding invitations, business cards, and a lot of posters. So I'm lucky to be able to use the shop and the type and the resources to be able to make posters to kind of help support the community. So these two posters were made over the last few years and we're lucky to be able to say, hey, if you can ship something in for paper, great. But if not, take a poster, take several posters, hand them out and, and leave them places. So it's been interesting walking around town to see um, the things that you've printed usually quite quickly uh, and see where they've ended up. So I'm showing here a piece from an exhibition I had at AS220 in 2021, just to kind of show off the letterpress printing process. I think a lot of times people think of um, really fiddly setting uh, small pieces of metal type, but our shop kind of specializes in wood type. So that means that the type is a little larger and you can actually do some uh, interesting things in terms of the form. So I'm sure I've 
uh, glossed over some of the fine printing technique here in this photo on the left, but you can see I've used a plastic disc to set type in a round form. So for me, it's nice to think about using text for its direct concrete meaning, but also using text to kind of come up with a, an interesting form and something that's visually a little bit um, more compelling. So in 2019, I started a project that I called Rename Victory Day because as a non uh, Rhode Island native, um, and I've heard that I have to say that forever because I wasn't born here. I can never say that I'm actually from Rhode Island. Um, I started a series of posters to rethink uh, why the holiday was named what it was named. And as I'll talk about later on, a lot of my work is based around the history of Japanese American incarceration during World War II. And so to me, this holiday always kind of struck in a sentiment that didn't feel particularly welcoming to people from the Asian American or Japanese American communities. So this poster series was set from wood type, just like the last slide, and invited Rhode Islanders to think about a different name for the holiday. So um, Quahog Day, uh, there was a Mayor's Bay Day because there's a Governor's Bay Day, dropped them off at the Mayor's office, did not hear back. Uh, lobster Roll Day was very popular, Beach Day. Um, I think I wanted to stick with the ocean beachy theme because it's the second Monday in August. And I realized that most people were taking the, the holiday to go to the beach. This was also uh, the first time I had tried to kind of use social media in a way that wasn't just looking up cat videos. So I tagged the posters with a hashtag to try and see how it was getting shared and where it was getting shared. So here's a grid of those posters from 2019. And in 2020, I decided to scale this project up a little bit. So. Here is a picture of some wood type that's about an inch and a half tall. And I've actually set it on a press and taken a quick scan. And from that scan, I've blown it up into a poster that you see here that's actually about 40 inches long by 13 inches tall. So I'm not only using the type to make my uh, direct prints, I'm using it also as kind of a starting point and a sketching place for larger prints. This typeface also didn't have a pound sign or a hashtag, so I had to do a little bit of um, creative reimagining on what that piece of type would have looked like. So from this series of posters, I tried to figure out ways to install them, uh, places downtown um, or other places in Rhode Island. And um, because I drink a lot of coffee, I was able to reach out to my local coffee shop and uh, my local liquor store, you know, very beverage centric. And this is also a storefront in downtown Providence. So I was able to create these larger installations of posters. And in this case, I used the posters from the year previous and it had kind of an almost American flag look to it, which was very unexpected, but I also liked um, that reference. And in the very bottom corner, I had a little statement so people could read about it and then also get involved if they wanted. In addition to these posters, they're there at Campus Fine Wines um, and Bolt Coffee, um, I actually ended up hiring a banner writing plane. So this is a very friendly pilot who works um, out of the airport um, down south. Um, and he actually is responsible for carrying this banner of huge nylon letters. So the letters actually get strung together and the people at the uh, plane office were super friendly and said, oh, you're an artist, feel free to come down, take pictures, see if we've spelled everything correctly. And so as you can see, these huge nylon letters are actually strung onto a net and they clip together. So they'll, at the end of the process, unclip everything and sort of rehang them. So it was a really interesting way to think about text and also, you know, how else it's used. And for me, because I make a lot of commercial prints, it was really cool to then engage this commercial form of advertising, which has been around for a really long time, to actually uh, share the message. So this is the um, field where they lay out the letters. And the plane can't take off with the letters because otherwise everything will get shredded as it gets picked up. So the um, ground team lays down the banner and there's a huge loop at one end that's hung between two uh, traffic cones. And the plane has a wire with a hook on it. So the plane actually takes off, comes back around, goes through the traffic cones with the hook and picks up the whole banner and then is in communication with the ground crew 
to make sure that the banner has flipped correctly uh, to make sure that it's uh, legible from the ground. So I learned that it's a very dangerous um, uh, career line in uh, pilots, uh, which I learned a lot of things that I didn't know that I didn't know that day. Um, but I also learned that this company will carry any message, including to someone's wedding with a note from his ex-wife, which was very exciting. Um, they also do things like hard seltzers, et cetera. Um, so the next slide is gonna be a picture of the plane right after it has taken the banner up. And it's interesting, you can really read it when you're at the beach, um, but from far away, it, it was pretty hard to take a picture of it. So this is actually a picture of the banner at the beach. Um, so again, delivering the message exactly to where everyone uh, who has the day off is at. And I was lucky to get a little bit of press this day. And my point, point was proved further because I couldn't park at the beach because the beach was so full. But fun fact, if you just tell the beach parking guard that you're meeting the news, they'll just let you in. So just hold that one in your back pocket as summertime comes up because I'm gonna try it once or twice more. So this project, uh, the plane was in 2020. 2021, I uh, printed some bookmarks uh, to also kind of mark the day, but had a little bit of a scaled down approach after the plane, which was a little bit more expensive uh, also than just regularly printing posters. So I did a little bit of crowdfunding, which was also a great growing moment as an artist to figure out how to involve the community and people who supported me and say, hey, this is a tangible thing, five bucks, 10 bucks, whatever you can do to help. So it's been interesting kind of now trying to scale that part of my practice to do it the official way, which is grant writing, which I'm sure as some of you know, just takes so much time often for so much or so little payoff. So that's kind of been the next step. So we're gonna take a pausing point. I'm gonna stop my screen share and we're gonna switch cameras. So this might be a little awkward. Um, hold on a second. So Michael, I'll have you switch me. So let me find your second. Um, so I just unmuted your second Thanks. screen, Lois. Okay, so let me just spotlight your second so screen. I can't hear you now. So Michael will feed questions to my camera person. Okay. And I'm just going to assume you guys are saying very nice things. <laughs> okay, so we're going to take a little bit of a walk around the shop. And I set up a printing demonstration on two of our presses. So you can kind of get a sense of how I'm using the equipment. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm at DWRI Letterpress, which is a commercial print shop. So over here, we have our giant industrial paper cutter. And most of the paper that we're printing from is uh, 26 by 40 inches. So it's coming in big and we're cutting it down afterward. And one thing I'll say about commercial printing that's great is that it really has opened up my range of papers that I'll use. I think coming from traditional printmaking, I was always really concerned with getting, you know, the very expensive Hanamula paper or Arturo, things like that, that for a poster you're just going to give away aren't necessarily uh, the smartest choice. So I'm going to turn on some equipment, which can be kind of loud. So I'm going to try to remember not to talk while I turn on the machine, which will work 30% of the time. So this press is called a Chandler and Price, and it's a platen press. So what that means is it's going to open and close like a clamshell. And this press is from, does anyone have any guesses? I'm gonna, I'll have people guess in the comments. So we'll have at least one question when we get to that point. So I'm gonna turn this press on. Before I turn the press on, I'm gonna talk about it and then I'll turn the press on. So it's got ink up here. We're printing this beautiful purple color and I'm printing from what's called a polymer plate, which is a flexible plastic printing plate. And we can print any typeface, any image. So polymer plate printing came up in about the eighties but has really made letterpress a contemporary choice for wedding invitations, et cetera. People aren't limited by the type that we have in house. This press is hand fed. So you'll see what that means in just a minute. So I'm putting each sheet in by hand and taking every sheet out. Okay, the camera person says you can all hear me. So we'll just keep going. <laughs> So the advantage of this press is that it's fast to set up. 
but it can be a little slower to uh, print. So if I have to print 500 of something, I'm gonna go to a different press. Okay. This is to save the date. Um, so these bars on the side will actually get cut off later on. So this press, we use it a lot. It runs every day and we do, um, I would say probably 70% of our jobs on that press. From, remember, guess which year it's from. So this press is similar, it's called a Kluge. And instead of ink, this press actually is for die cutting. So this is one of my favorite commercial forms of uh, printing that you can use for artistic practices. So for instance, if I need a, a hexagonal shape print, this is gonna be the press to do it. So in the press, you can actually see, if we get closer, is a cutting die that's got pink foam around um, a metal piece of wool, and it's actually cutting out envelope liners. So again, very wedding themed this week at the shop. So as we move back through the shop, those first two presses have been hand fed. So I'm actually inserting a sheet as we go. The next three presses down the line are all automatic. So that means that it's slower to get them set up but I can run a lot more pieces. So 500 pieces, a thousand pieces, maybe in an hour, maybe more. So this press is called a Heidelberg windmill. Uh, you know, this machine in particular is probably from around 1945. That's a clue for how old the first press was. Um, and it's set up now to run a postcard. So I'm gonna show you how it feeds and this one will be a little louder. So it's got a system of suckers here and a system of air that's gonna pick up sheets on this side, pull it through to print, and then drop them off on the right. So you can see that was pretty quick to get through that little stack of prints. And we actually just printed these. Remember how we said it, we love Bolt coffee earlier? Uh, this is a fun postcard for Bolt that again is oversized and we'll cut down later. This print also has what's called a rainbow roll. So it's actually one printing pass, but it's got pink on one side and yellow on the other in a, a nice fade. So that's the windmill. And then we're gonna walk past the machines that cast hot metal type. So again, when people think of letter press printing, they think of moving a letter um, piece by piece and stringing together a line. Uh, these two machines and one in the corner actually cast metal type. So you'll type on a keyboard and actually drop uh, specific molds or what's called a matrix. And each matrix has a different letter form in it that's brass. And so from the brass molds, you'll actually create a new line of type, which is always very hard to see um, on phone or camera. So when we're done printing with this line of type, we can actually put it into the back of the machine and there's a crucible of hot metal that will actually remelt and then we can cast new type. So a little bit about hot metal and as we go this way, we're gonna pass another machine that's a windmill and actually is set up to run foil. So foil is another fun thing to think about for you know, adding an element to you know, we've done foil stamping on etchings and uh, screen prints, just another way to get a different texture into a surface. So this is the front of that save the date. Oh, this one's printed twice, I didn't even notice. I promise we read the save the dates. So if we come this way, I've set up a little printing demo um, and you, you can see here, we've got a collection of wood type that I mentioned earlier. Um, I'm just hiding the printing demo. So the wood type, is great to use because it's bigger to set up as I mentioned. And we have kind of a big range. So anything from kind of the standard Gothic to we've got some really weird stuff down here. This is called 10 years. And the wood type is all from end grain wood. So it's often a fruit wood, something really hard or like a maple, but it is somewhat, um, delicate. So you can see here we have some broken letters that sometimes, you know, maybe the type has been damaged, maybe it's been printed with too much impression, which is how hard we're printing a sheet. So if we come over here, um, this press is called an Asburn and it's a cylinder press. 
So what that means is it's gonna roll versus opening and closing like a platen press. So for this press, I've got on this um, great hot pink color and we're gonna print a sheet here. It's two actually. You can see I can print a sheet that's bigger just because of the nature of the press. And I've set up uh, just kind of a specimen sheet of some wood type that's new to us. So I'm not necessarily making a word, but in this case, just trying to make a little bit more of an abstract shape. So if I wanted to change this, what I can do is um, unlock the type, which is locked up with a coin. And so these coins are actually spring loaded. So if anyone has ever heard the, um, the phrase, Turn, uh, coin a phrase, that's what the coin is referencing. So now that I've unlocked the coin, which has got everything nice and tight, we can pretty easily move our text block around. I said that a little easier than it wants to go. There might be a little pressure also in here. Now, if, again, if I was locking this up properly, I would be applying pressure from both sides as well as the top and the bottom. But because I am kind of just getting a proof and checking you know, if I'm going to use this type in the future and also just check taking a look at the color, we're not being too particular. So this is called a plane and I've locked my coin halfway and I'm just gently going to tap the plane. You want all your type to be the same height. Sometimes the wood type can shift or wobble a little bit. Does anyone know how high type I is? Okay, put your guess in the question and answer. I'll figure out a fun prize to send. If Michael will share your address with me. And Michael can help me figure out what the fun prize is. Okay, so this was the print we just pulled. And now, this is our change. So again, you know, I'm thinking in this case about not necessarily about the words, but more thinking about how I can use text as a form and also thinking about this as maybe the background for something to come later on. So if we want to make a poster, it's really easy to come in on the weekend and say, okay, I've got an hour. Um, I'm going to pick three different typefaces. I know, you know where the poster needs to say. Uh, the event is, what time it is, if it costs anything, and then I can say, okay, now come pick it up. So we're going to come over to a different press, which is called, called an Asburn. Or no, I'm sorry, that was the Asburn. This is the Vanderjoek. So this press is really similar, and this press will probably look familiar to anyone who's taken a class. A lot of universities have them. Um, AS220 has one. It's a pretty easy press to learn how to operate versus the cylinder or the, I'm sorry, the platen presses, which can be a little bit more intimidating. So right now I have a really nice uh, bright blue set up. So we're gonna print this on its own. So you can see I've got a little pink here because I was using a dirty sheet of paper to proof earlier, but just taking a look to see Seems like I've got, I kind of thought this was the same typeface, but it definitely looks like it's different. This one's bigger and this seems like it's the condensed version of it. So again, when you get a bunch of new wood type, it's fun to check out what things actually look like. So I'm gonna do a proof with the blue on top of the pink. And it's one of my favorite things to work with in letterpress printing, it's called overprinting. And it's just like what it sounds. I'm gonna put one color on top of the other color and come up with another color in the middle. So it's uh, commercial printers, we really like it because you get uh, three colors for the price of two. And some really interesting things happen that even if you set it up digitally, it will never look as warm as it does when it's printed. So what's my first? 
All right. So here we go. So I've picked kind of the classic 1950s sci-fi color scheme. So you can see where the fluorescent pink is coming through the blue, it's making a really nice kind of purpley color. Um, and it's interesting too, you know, where things overlap, they get darker and so your eye is kind of drawn there. But again, we're not really actually reading any information. So it's kind of tricky to see what's actually happening. And so I'll probably use um, these two background layers and maybe put something in a really heavy black font over the top. Um, so again, I'm just trying to think of ways, in this case, to think of a background that's a little bit more interesting. So here is, this was the one uh, with the type space out. This was the one with the pink closer together. And so it's kind of interesting to see just that little change uh, what's happened. So I'm going to push the blue together and then we'll see which one we like the most. So I'm going for a coin key. <laughs> and again, we're just going to push our type together. So with these colors, I'm using what's called transparent white. And the transparent white is going to help thin out the color so that it's um, a little bit thinner so that you can really see through it. We often mix colors with opaque white so that the colors are a little brighter, but it's nice to have some variety between the two so that you can pick and choose which application is going to be the best. Ooh, I think I like this one the most. So, had both colors close. One color close together, and then both colors kind of spaced out. So I can't quite decide, but again, it also sort of depends on what I'm going to print on the top of it. But it, you know, because we have so much access to the equipment, it's nice to be able to come in and be able to play around a little bit with the color. So speaking of color, we're going to loop around this way because I forgot to lift up some rollers. So in terms of the color that we use. Sorry, I forgot to lift up those rollers. We do a lot of custom Pantone matching. So over here is our um, kind of collection of different Pantone inks. And so again, this is another big departure from fine art printmaking to uh, commercial printing. We can pick any Pantone book, or I'm sorry, any Pantone swatch. So um, does anyone have a favorite color? I forgot I can't hear anyone. This is usually how this part of the tour goes. Okay. Oh, I heard. Uh, 285 in the back. Um, so I'll find the 285 swatch in the book and then I'll be able to say, okay, this has process blue, which is actually here, reflex blue, which is back here, and then also transparent white with a different ratio. So for every color, I'm actually able to get exactly onto this book. And sometimes I'll also say, okay, it's going to print on a yellow paper. I'm going to need to change this blue so that it looks like this even though I'm not actually printing this color. So in addition to the colors that we have to mix from, we also have a bunch of other colors ready to go. And as I walk back over to my desk, uh, camera person Chris will show you some of those different colors. So one thing that's very important that sometimes we struggle with is this color versus the computer color. So we spend a lot of time, hopefully working with clients to say, okay, if you're gonna print a color, it's important to see it in person because this green is gonna look different on my computer versus your computer and somebody else's computer. So for us, it's really important to say, okay, we're gonna actually take the time and the money to make something. Let's look at it together and make sure that we're on the same page. So I did wanna point out one other, uh, nope. I can't get back there. Totally forgot there was something about it. So I forget that I said that. Okay, so I'm gonna unplug while you look at some ink and I'll meet you back at the computer.
Okay, perfect. Chris, you're off the hook. So now I'm going to spotlight uh, this other account for you, Lois. <clears throat> Actually, let me um, unspotlight Chris. Perfect. Okay, Excellent. Thanks. That was great. Thank you. I'm going to mute myself now so you can keep going. Okay, great. Well, I'm glad that actually, can you unmute, can you mute yourself on that one? Sorry, I'm hearing two of myself, which nobody ever needs. So uh, thank you for bearing with us as we kind of figured out that tech walk around. So I'm going to show a few more slides and then hopefully you have some uh, questions in mind and we can hop into a Q&A that Michael will help facilitate. So let's see, I'm going to go back to share my screen. We just did this 20 minutes ago. We've really got it locked in now. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that I have coming up. So I wanted to share this series of posters that the U.S. government printed um, uh, announcing the start of Japanese American internment. And so I mentioned earlier that my family has a history with this and my paternal grandmother was incarcerated at Poston, Arizona from 1942 to 1945. So these posters were actually printed and put up in neighborhoods announcing um, you know, where to report, when and what was happening. And I'm actually very lucky my great uncle just sent a copy of this instructions to all persons of Japanese ancestry poster um, to uh, my office. And so I'm, uh, I've been referencing it for several years, but it's actually been really nice to see it um, in person. And actually uh, the paper is really thick. I think in this photo, it looks like it's very thin, but it, it almost feels like it's on something like cardboard. And that poster is actually at the um, Woonsocket Museum of Arts and Culture in a show that's up through March 18th um, that's in conjunction with an exhibit from the Smithsonian called Writing a Wrong. And I'd really recommend um, that you check out that exhibition. It's really well put together in the um, Rhode Island Historical Society has done such a great job um, with that piece uh, and that exhibition. So again, Michael mentioned uh, that a lot of my prints reference um, this work and uh, this poster in particular. And so these two posters were created in 2017 for a show at AS220. And they're actually pretty direct references to that poster. So if we flip back through, Oops, nope, just kidding. Okay, yep. So I've pulled out elements from the poster and um, actually used type that would have been pretty close in terms of the time period to recreate these two prints. And so out of context, they're a really great starting point for uh, a conversation about incarceration, which I didn't realize isn't quite as widely known on the East Coast as it is on the West Coast. So for me, these works have been um, great places to start that conversation and um, you know, talk about what that period of time meant to my family and a lot of other people's family. And also to start to think about um, reparations because that's something that my family um, received and, and you know, what that means down the line uh, for other conversations about reparations. Um, so a project that's building off of that work is, uh, I'm working on it, feverishly working on it now for this year, and it's called Wish You Were Here, and it's uh, supported with funding from the Interlace Grant Fund, which is a new fund uh, started in Rhode Island that does project grants and also emergency funding for artists. So it's um, administered by Dirt Palace Projects and also Providence Galleries. So this photo is something that I'm researching um, called, uh, I'm sorry, it's a, an aerial photo of uh, Tool Lake, which is another incarceration site. And so I've been actually looking through a lot of different archives. Um, and the great thing about, you know, coronavirus is that, well, sorry, I shouldn't ever say the great thing about coronavirus, but mostly it's just made research a lot easier to get to especially now in the last few years. So it's been, um, you know, because I haven't been able to go to these places in person and there's also nothing left at this site particularly, um, it's been nice to kind of hop into all of these different online resources. Um, this is a monument uh, from Manzanar, which is uh, a site in California that's actually had the most work done to sort of um, rebuild some of the buildings and also to 
uh, educate. So there's a, it's a national park, there's a, a visitor center. And it was very strange to see some of the posters that I've been referencing on a coffee cup and on a tote bag, which I'm sort of regretting not purchasing uh, for my studio. Um, but it was definitely had a different feel than I was expecting to, um, you know, to have a small museum, but also to have the gift shop component, which every uh, national park site does. So I'm showing you these different uh, reference photos of incarceration sites because my plan for the project is to turn these different sites into large silkscreen posters that um, are based in the style of works progress administration posters. So I think a lot of people have seen this style of work where it's big graphic uh, posters, um, beautiful scenic areas, and again, a little bit of overprinting uh, that we just talked about. So the idea is to create large posters representing different incarceration sites, and also some smaller letterpress uh, versions of those uh, posters, because that's where I'm happiest to print. Um, and those will be hopefully displayed in the fall at Katie Tompkins projects. Um, and I'm still figuring out dates and time. So I'll definitely share those as I have them. Um, in addition to the posters, the grant is also funding a penny press. So penny presses are um, commonly seen at um, amusement parks, zoos, uh, national parks. And the idea is that there are four different um, molds or options that you can choose from. Uh, and you can actually put a, an image on a penny. So you can put a new penny in and 50 cents or sometimes a 25 cents. I'm gonna see if I can figure out how to make it zero cents. Um, and you'll actually receive a souvenir that's been extruded onto the penny. So for me, it's another way to kind of engage people directly into my process. So by picking the specific site that you want on the penny and actually, you know, making the penny itself, you kind of become complicit in the project and you're, you're then making the sculpture and taking away um, this small item and this small artifact. So I'm figuring out what information goes with that penny smasher and um, how that kind of comes together as part of the exhibition. So again, hopefully at Katie Tompkins Projects, but I'm also excited to be able to share that resource with the community. So as you're thinking about future art club exhibitions, if anybody wants to borrow the penny press, um, Michael, just let me know because I think it could be really fun. So I think that's my last slide. I put together some contact information here. Michael mentioned my website. Here's my email address. You can also call me on the phone. Um, and I also put my Instagram. I'm lucky because I've got a specific first name and last name. So that's often the easiest way to find me. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And I'm actually gonna have the second camera turn off its screen. And then Michael, I think, let's see if there are any questions. I know that was kind of a lot of information very quickly. So no, I'm happy fantastic. to give folks a, a minute to percolate too. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lois. That was so great between seeing the work you're working on and seeing all the different presses that you all have. Amazing, amazing. Um, so let me go to the chat. So awesome. as people have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. I'll read them for you just so everyone can hear them. Um, so the first uh, question in the chat is from Marge Wheeler. And it says, during the ink tour, we see all the different colors. How long does ink last? Um, and do you have to do anything to revive it? Um, as when Chris was pointing at some of the inks, they looked hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the... It, okay, sorry, to start, step back, we use inks that are rubber-based and inks that are oil-based. 90% of the printing we do is with rubber-based, or I'm sorry, oil-based ink. And it's actually gonna form a thick skin on the top that you were seeing in the video. And so that wrinkly top um, is pretty dry, but it's keeping everything below it uh, usable and open. So really similar to oil paints or to traditional etching inks, you can actually dig in under that skin and get to new ink. The rubber-based inks actually are formulated to dry very slowly. And so with those ink, they won't ever form a skin. You'll actually be able to use those inks um, as you would. And so if we have a press uh, that's only printing black ink, we'll actually leave rubber-based rubber -based black on that press so that we can use it um, for many days in a row. 
uh, I think that hopefully answers the question. And you'll see too, uh, we love getting coffee, partly because we love coffee, but also we need the cups. So we used to be close to a seven stars. Now we're close to a Dunkin' Donuts. Sometimes we go to Bolt if we're feeling fancy and going downtown, so. Excellent, thank you. Um, Alice Beckwith asked, could you say a bit more about your prints of signal flags used on boats? Oh yeah, I totally forgot to talk about those. I, there was just too much to jam into one mm -hmm. uh, Zoom. So in uh, last year for that show at AS220, I made a, a series of signal prints uh, that were based on nautical signal flags. So I think I was thinking a lot about uh, really direct forms of communication. I think wearing a mask, I'm always worried. I can't hear people, people can't hear me. I'm being misunderstood. And also too, just coming out of the election, thinking about misinformation, how I can say one thing and then it gets turned into something else. So I wanted a very clear, specific um, way to communicate. And so the flags came up, some other nonverbal forms of communication came up. And actually, Michael, let me pull up an image if you don't mind. Sure. And the flags were um, all taken from their actual meanings, but some of them end up being um, kind of poignant, which is nice. Let's see. Uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to share an image. Hold on a second. But also as someone who is not from a place of a lot of uh, uh, nautical things. It was also really fun to learn about the different signal flags and their different meanings. Um, so let's see. Oh, here's an image. Oh, nope, I picked the blurriest image. Okay, we'll try one more time. Okay, great. Now I've got it. Uh, Oh, Michael, my screen has not, my screen share has not worked. Okay, technical difficulty. Okay, here we go. Okay, can everyone see that? Great, so this is what all of the flags looked like together. And it was also fun to think about a printed edition and saying, okay, there are 26 letters. There's gonna be a whole set of 25. Um, and some of them had uh, the meanings, you know, were very direct and nautical, like um, you're too close. Uh, please steer away from me. Um, you know, my ship is on fire. Uh, do you have a pilot on board? Um, but some of them, you know, were straightforward, like negative and could really be used in any context. So I think in thinking about my older work that was based on those government posters, it was again about taking something out of its regular context and sort of turning it into something else without altering the form too much. This project was really fun to work on because I got to hire a coworker um, who actually helped me print, um, which is always a great step as an artist to say, oh, I'm too busy. I've got to hire some help. But in this case, she was far more competent at this style of printing, uh, which I wasn't as comfortable with. Letterpress printing with a large solid is often pretty tricky. So having her be able to troubleshoot it was, was really nice and helpful. And th this set of prints um, is now in the RISD Museum, which I'm very excited about. That's great. Did that kind of answer the question, Alice? I think that was a good answer. Okay, great. I think that was great. Um, and congratulations on that entering Thank the RISD you. Museum. That's amazing. Um, Lisa Goddard uh, asked, and this is a good question from a, a true printmaker, Lisa Goddard, what is your favorite press at DWRI? By the way? Do you have a favorite? Oh, can Lisa, that it? is such a tough question. I feel like mm -hmm. they can hear me. Um, and so I should uh, choose carefully. Um, <laughs> I think for me, I really like the windmill that we looked at, uh, kind of one of the last presses, partly because uh, of the automatic nature. So once something is set up and running, it's really easy to make 500 of something or 250 of something. And so the idea of being able to make a multiple so quickly, is really appealing. Interesting, great. Mm -hmm. uh, Sandra Bazile asked, um, I'm wondering what, uh, if you are taking specific, any specific steps uh, in your rename Victory Day project, which is a really important mission. Can you talk more about some specific steps you've taken? Yes. So when I started the project in 2019, I started it as an artist and just someone who, you know, had an idea and wanted to share that and start a conversation. 
little did I know that making legislative change is actually very difficult. And so I'm not sure if anyone here has ever gotten involved in that process. It was something that, you know, I had taken a civics class and kind of understood how people were elected and what their roles were, but didn't actually understand what that looked like day to day. So because my project was so visual, I was able to connect with a few other people that um, were more minded towards organization and also interested in the same thing. So we were able to contact a representative last year who um, had wanted to support the bill and write the bill. Um, but then it was interesting to learn about um, the interpersonal politics of elected officials and um, learning that even though a person had committed and said they were going to do this thing, there was actually someone else that they needed to help a little bit more and sort of what that process is like. So right now there's no official bill proposed to rename Victory Day uh, to Ocean State Day or anything that I had suggested. There is a bill that I believe is about to be proposed that will change Victory Day to Emancipation Day and, re, uh, and move it from the second Monday to the first Monday. And I haven't quite decided to support that bill, partly because in my mind, the most direct path to change is the easiest one. So I wasn't really ready to move the holiday because I think a lot of Rhode Islanders, oh, it's the second Monday in August, I have it off. And so changing the date seemed like a friction point. And also I have no problem with the change to Emancipation Day. The only problem is that the bill doesn't address why the name is being changed. It's just changing it to something else. And so the rep putting it forward wants to do a lot of education work and um, lecture series around Emancipation Day, but I think that there needs to be some mention and involvement of the Asian American community and Japanese American community, because otherwise it seems like it's just leapfrogging the holiday um, to something else. And I think, you know, let's just let it be a beach holiday. That's really what it's turned into. And so I think that it, it, it's an easy step. So it was kind of a long-winded answer to say, yes, but no. And I think it's going to be a few years, which is something else that I learned that nothing really happens overnight. It's a, it's a really long process. That's great. Thank you, Lois. Mm -hmm. um, Carolyn Winter asked, have you visited the Japanese American Memorial in Washington, DC? It's off the beaten path in terms of monuments, but seeing its central bronze sculpture is well worth the detour. Carolyn, I haven't yet, so I'll definitely take that recommendation um, to heart. I think I um, am trying to figure out a trip that way anyway to visit the Smithsonian and also look at some other archive materials in person. So it sounds like that's a really nice way um, to tie it in. And I think, you know, the idea of monuments in general is something also that I like to think about, you know, who makes it, why is it made, who, who sees it, who uses it. So seeing, you know, a version of, um, another monument is always really interesting to me in general too. Thank you. Um, Cynthia DiDonato asked, what have some of the responses of viewers um, been to your work dealing with internment or with renaming Victory Day? Yeah, I'll start with the latter. So um, a lot of people who have contacted me about Victory Day are really in support of the name change and have also sort of been thinking about it. Um, I've connected with other members of the Japanese American community, um, other groups that feel marginalized. Um, I think especially with um, the last election, there's been just a lot more comfort with people um, using really aggressive or offensive language. Um, feelings of xenophobia, I think are really heightened. I think everyone, you know, there's just sort of been a little bit more leniency with um, really expressing how you feel, whether it's um, for or against. And so the negative response has been pretty limited just because it's um, been a lot of surface emails and strange comments that are really hard to take seriously, especially on social media, because there hasn't really been a person to actually talk to. And I think with my work around internment, it's been pretty successful in terms of, um, you know, inviting people to learn more about the topic. And because my story is so personal and um, it's been kind of a nice entry point for people. The other thing that I'll say is, um, and this is not uncommon uh, or not just specific to me, is that a lot of people from my generation, the generation above who had family or parents in the camps don't know a lot about the camps personally because it's something that was really not talked about. So 
my dad, whose mother was in turn, learned about incarceration when he was in 10th grade and he learned about it in history class. And he'll say, he said at home, you, you'll never believe what happened to Japanese people. And she said, yeah, it was not a great time. And they didn't really talk about it much more after that. So for me, it's been an interesting process to get to know my own family's history a little bit more, but to also understand that there will be gaps there. Um, but because I'm also coming to it as somewhat of an outsider while still being a little bit of an insider, it's also been a good point to say, oh, I didn't know this. Maybe somebody else didn't know this. And so keeping everything kind of at that first level of um, understanding has been really helpful. I will say it is also tricky though, to then feel responsible for being able to deliver a PhD level explanation of incarceration, which is something that I'm working, I'm not actually working towards, but just reading and researching on my own, because I think it is then hard to be the person starting the conversation, but not being the representative and all person for, for that conversation and that information. So. That's great. Thank you, Lois. Um, another comment in the chat is from Amy, who said, thank you so much. Your studio tour and internment related artwork is so interesting. Terrific resources for teaching in history classrooms. Thank you, Amy. Uh, and then Lisa said also, thank you, Lois. This was wonderful. Um, let's see. Nathaniel Reed said, is there a printmaking process you want uh, to work with um, that DWRI doesn't have the equipment for? Mm, that's a good question. Um, and I think part of the reason that I wrote that interlace grant around screen printing was that I just really want to make something big and letterpress printing is often not the best way to do it. For those renamed Victory Day posters that are 40 inches long, they actually have to go through the press twice. So it's pretty labor intensive. You print the first half and then it gets flipped and you kind of line everything back up and hope that it, it comes out looking straight on the final print. So screen printing is something that I'm really interested in getting back into. And I just moved my personal studio over to the works, which is on Acorn Street. And it's a group of artist spaces, but they also have a fully functional print shop. So I'll be um, able to work on etchings and also hopefully make large uh, scale prints there. And I forgot to mention too, I'll be working on that body of work while I'm at Anderson Ranch in Colorado. And I'm gonna leave uh, next month on the 16th and be there for 15 weeks. And they have a really beautiful print shop. So I'll plan to um, make some etchings there, um, really kind of get back into that technical process while also trying to experiment a little bit. They encourage you to get out of your comfort zone. So I'm learning about 3D scanners this week and also 3D printers. Um, I like to use a lot of models or maquettes in my work and in my drawings. So I'd love to figure out how to be able to recreate those forms that I'm using and kind of scale them up and down digitally without actually having to make a model. So, and of course, 3D scan like stuff like a pencil and definitely stuff that they're gonna roll their eyes at, but you just gotta try it while you have access. So. <laughs> That's great. Excellent. Um, does anyone else have questions that you'd like to put in the chat? Feel free to put in your questions. Um, I have a couple questions of my own. One is that to me as a non printmaker, um, DWRI's space looks big and it looks like you have a lot of machines as far as letterpress shops goes. Are you a big shop? Are you a small shop? Like what does the average shop have in terms of tools? That is a great question. So letterpress printers are often machine hoarders. Um, and I hopefully said that loud enough so that Dan could hear. Um, <laughs> we have a lot of different equipment in the shop um, and a lot of it is duplicate. So at this point we're collecting machines for parts because oftentimes people aren't making the machines anymore and let alone the parts. So um, in a lot of shops, you'll often see that Vandercook where I was printing the blue layer. AS220 has one, RISD has one. It's again, really easy to learn how to use and make something fast. The downside is that they're now very expensive. So I think Dan picked up that press uh, just for the cost of moving it um, 15 years ago. Nowadays, a press like that is gonna be $10,000, $13,000. And really just because people have learned how to use them a little bit. Um, our shop is different, I would say, in terms of scale. The hot metal is really unique. Um, also the range of presses that we have is unique. So some people will have a one windmill maybe, maybe one CNP that we saw at the beginning. Primarily it's a lot of cylinder presses. So the great thing about working here is that we have flexibility in terms of 
you know, seeing every job that comes in and saying, okay, this is going to go on this press because that press is free. It's the best press or, oh, it's got to go on this press because there's something else on that press. So we can really keep things moving. Excellent. Very cool. Um, Barbara Vokala asked, can you buy new wood type or are you limited to vintage type? Barbara, this is a great question. Again, wood type was easier to get to, but now it's a little trickier to get to, partly because people want it because it is so fun and easy to use. Um, also, sometimes you'll see it broken up and people will sell it as a decorative thing, whereas it's great to keep it intact. One of those cases of type that we looked at, that could be anywhere from $100 to $500, depending on what the type is, how rare it is, how complete the set is. There are a few people still making wood type, but primarily it's used type. Um, we actually worked with AS220 to help CNC route uh, some missing letters from a type that we had, but for the most part, it is finding um, old type. Excellent. Um, when you were at RISD, was letterpress a big area of study or did you have to train yourself a lot in learning how to do it? Yeah, so letterpress was so new uh, to printmaking, at least. Graphic design has always taught it, but if anyone is familiar at RISD, sometimes it's really hard to take a class outside of your major. So I actually took a letterpress printing class at AS220 uh, when I was a junior. And then the next year they offered it in the printmaking department. And actually Dan, who's the shop owner, teaches that class. And that's how we first met. So for me, I loved printmaking and still love the technique of traditional printmaking, but didn't really uh, like the idea that uh, that market is so hard to get into. So for me, being able to make a commercial run of letterpress prints is great because I can give posters away, I can sell posters cheaply, or I can do something like the signal flags, which I can sell individually or sell as a bigger suite as more of a fine art edition, if that makes sense. So you can kind of walk both sides while still using the commercial equipment. Excellent. Uh, another question from the chat from Carlos is, what are some letterpress artists or print studios whose work you admire and what inspires your work? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, yes, I really like um, New House Press uh, on the um, West Coast. I almost just said East Coast. Huge um, graphic prints with a lot of overlapping color. And I just love that they're using letterpress printing to make such big abstract shapes. And I also really like Amos Paul Kennedy Jr. Um, whose shop is called Pile of Bricks. And Amos does really amazing posters and broadsides and does a lot of really layered printing. So that overprinting that we looked at for the demonstration, his shop really does a lot of that. And um, he's got a really interesting story too. So I'd recommend checking out both of those folks. Great. Thank you. Another question in the chat is, did you start working on projects regarding Japanese internment since your time at RISD or more so uh, after you graduated? More so after. I think um, I, I wish I had waited to go to art school until I kind of had fully formed as a human, which is so interesting to go back and uh, be a guest critic at RISD and kind of with that lens. And also I started to make that work after my grandmother passed away. I'm not sure if I would have made it while she was still alive, um, but it has been you know, really interesting to think about um, being able to bridge the commercial historical form of printing that I use day to day for work and also that historical um, piece of my family's history and uh, the country's history. And that's sort of where they intersect, which has been really nice. That's great, thank you. Uh, and Nancy asked, do you use a risograph and can you describe what it is? Nancy, this is a great question. We don't have a risograph. It's essentially um, a, a Japanese version of if screen printing and uh, offset printing or laser printing had been fused together. So you're actually making what's called a master image by scanning or copying a sheet. And that's then transferred to a drum, which is then transferring ink onto another sheet, I think. Um, it's really become popular in the last few years because it is fairly economical because it is similar to a copy machine and can run off a bunch of copies. They're also notoriously difficult to register, which some people really value. So it's kind of, it's definitely got a look to it. Um, we don't have any here. We had one briefly and decided we couldn't learn anything new. Um, but if you're interested, Binch Press in Providence has two or three, and it is a really interesting way to think about making a color image, so. Excellent. 
Thank you. Um, Barbara asked in the chat if uh, we could get the names of those uh, studios that you were mentioning in the chat. Yeah. And if you can't oh, put them sure. in the chat or just want to email them to me, I can circulate them to the group afterwards. Yeah. Um, I'll do it while you ask the next question. Okay. Uh, Cliff also said, thank you, Lois, for a great Zoom talk and tour. Um, Alice Beckwith asked, do you know if there were print shops that were in the camps, in the Japanese internment camps? That is a good question. Um, the answer is yes. So the camps were kind of uh, smaller versions of cities. So there were um, people who were responsible for the mess, uh, the kitchen, um, people that were responsible for first aid, for mail, um, things like that. And, and there were actually some, um, one of your jobs could be creating government posters um, or materials that were printed in the camp. So it, it might not be something as involved as our shop, but there were definitely screen printing shops um, and also um, sometimes newspapers too that would have used similar equipment. Excellent, awesome. Um, so it's seven o'clock now. Does anyone have one last question you'd like to ask? Or I will ask one last question. Um, so you have your Anderson Ranch residency coming up, which is incredibly exciting. Is there anything else on the horizon that you want to share with everyone that's exciting or that you're looking forward to? Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> so we talked about Anderson Ranch. Uh, we're going to show those WPA posters at some point. Oh, I'm working with, uh, thank you, Michael, uh, My Home Court, which is a nonprofit that's also run in conjunction with Providence Galleries. And they work with the Providence Parks Department to resurface a basketball court and bring in an artist to create um, a mural that goes on the top. So I'm really excited to be working with them and uh, at Davis Park, which is uh, in my neighborhood on Chalkstone near um, Nathaniel Green and the VA hospital. So um, I'm working with them to finalize the design and then they'll work with a great team that actually paints the court. And there will be an unveiling sometime in mid-September. So I'll keep everyone posted to hopefully via social media when all of those dates are finalized. Awesome, thank you, Lois. Um, so thank you again, Lois, for a wonderful, fascinating, chock full presentation just what I expected it would be so wonderful. Um, the other thing I would say is that if you are in the area and want to um, see an example of what DWRI Letterpress does, we do have a number of examples of their work up in the gallery at the Art Club right now. Um, they printed some wonderful poems to go along with Gail Mandel's show that's up through March 4th. So if you go to Maxwell May's gallery through March 4th, you can see what they do. It's very nice. Um, and the other plug that I will make is that our next talk like this is going to be um, at the end of March, and it's going to be Eric Telfort, who's the chair of the illustration department at RISD, which is very exciting. We will have more information about that up on the website in the next couple of weeks from Eric. Um, so thank you again to Lois. Thank you to everyone for joining us. What a great presentation. Have a good night, everybody. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.